Assalamu alaikum, everyone. All right, inshallah, I'll get started. Wa alaikum assalam, bitte, jitte rao. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'khbiru, wa na'uzu billah min shiruri anfusina wa min sayi'ati a'malina. Man yahdihi allahu falamudillala, wa man yudlil falahadiyala. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa allahu, wahdahu la sharika la, anna muhammadun abduhu wa rasooluhu. Ya ayyuhu allazina amanutuku allaha, haqqa tukatihi, wa la tamutunna, illa wa antum muslimoon. Ya ayyuhu al-nas, attaku rabukum al-lazi khalakakum min nafsin wahida, wa khalaka minha zawjaha, wa batha minhuma, rijalin kathiran wa nisa'a, wa taku allahi al-lazi tusa'aluna bihi wa al-arham, inna allaha kana alaykum rakiba. Ya ayyuhu al-lazina amanutuku allaha wa kulu kawlan sadida, yuslih lakum amalakum, wa yaghfir lakum zunubakum, man yati allaha wa rasooluhu faqad faza fawdan azimah. Amalwan. My dear brothers and sisters, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. Allah guides who he wishes and Allah can misguide who he wishes. This universe and everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah khair. May Allah give us guidance and may Allah give us uh, uh, wisdom and knowledge. Ameen. Allahumma ameen. Alhamdulillah, I am so grateful to be here today and again reflect on the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again. Uh, today, I'd like to reflect on the name Al-Wali. The meaning of Al-Wali is the ruler. And Al-Wali should not be confused with another name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which many of you may be familiar with, uh, and that is Al-Wali. So same root letters, just uh, different uh, variation of that word. So Al-Wali means the protector. Al-Wali means the ruler or the governor. Al-Ghazali tells us that a true ruler is one who can organize, plan for his subjects, as well as cause the subjects to, um, you know, cause the subject to jump into action. And that impact, these three things will make an impactful ruler. And without the ability to organize, project power, cause action, then we can't say that that person or that entity is the supreme ruler. So we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of rulers. Looking around us, we can see all kinds of systems that Allah has created for us and systems that continue to operate without any intervention from us or, or, or even directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are just continuous systems that keep on going. One of these systems, one of these examples that we can look at is the rising of the sun. There are many examples, but let's just uh, go with this one for now. There's nothing we can do that can cause the sun to rise or fall when we want it to. So with the sun... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is organizing our affairs for us. You know, we've been giving a start and an end to our day. And the sun is also a display of power from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, as the younger kids would say, that's a flex from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we, we don't control the sun. The rising and setting of the sun, while we don't control it, has a direct impact on us. So we feel good when the sun is shining outside. We also feel a sense of happiness when there's brightness outside. Uh, and no clouds, you know, covering that sunshade. And our bodies also are telling us, you know, that this is the time to do work. So the organization of salah is another aspect that is aligned with the rising and setting of the sun. So there are two times of the day when we pray when the sun is out, and there are two times when the sun is set, and once when the sun is actually setting. So this system, this nizam that Allah has created for us is all because of this creation of the sun. So Allah is training us to understand the finite nature of the world um, that we're living in. So we, if we continue on this thread for a second, just like the rising of the sun, you know, we too will rise again on the day of judgment. And just like the setting of the sun, we too will find ourselves coming to an end in this world. You know, and, and that's just not it. The sun also gives us hope. It is teaching us that darkness is present only as long as there is an absence of light. And that for us, is a sign of hope. And just like the finite number of hours the sun is shining on us, there's also a finite amount of time within which darkness can consume us. So all of this, you know, will seem like, you know, just a metaphor to you. But let me assure you that this goes beyond metaphor, just, you know, talking about metaphysics for a moment. You know, we know from the Quran that Allah encourages us all to reflect on the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And why reflect on the creations? 
because we cannot directly see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because we can't see Allah directly, the only way to learn about our creator is through his creations. And learning about Allah is part of this journey about learning the 99 names of Allah. So for example, in Surah Al-Fusilat, um, uh, verse 36, we are told, among his signs are the day and the night, the sun and the moon. Do not prostrate to the sun or the moon, but prostrate to Allah who created them all, if you truly worship him alone. Let's reflect on this verse for a moment. Allah is telling us that the day and the night, the sun and the moon, are signs from Allah. And what do we know about signs? Signs inform us about something. They guide us towards something. They stop us from danger. They stop us from making a mistake. Signs help us to see our options in that moment so that we can plan, we can decide, and we can act. And without signs, we will be guessing. So imagine yourself on a crossroad. You know, what is that supposed to tell you? What kind of dangers there are out there? So speculating would be more like it if we had no signs whatsoever. And as the old saying goes, it'll be like taking stabs in the dark. You know, worse yet, we could be following others who are also just as lost as we are if there were no signs. So in this beautiful verse from Allah, right after Allah declares that the day and the night, the sun and the moon are signs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is telling us to prostrate to Allah and not to his creation. And Allah is not saying that, hey, you must prostrate to Allah because I said so. Allah is telling us because that he created the sun and the moon. And if you truly believe that Allah is the creator of the sun and the moon, the day and the night, then worship Allah and worship Allah alone. Subhanallah. Let that, let that soak in for a second. So going back to Ghazali, you know, Ghazali tells us that for a true ruler, they must have organization, power, and action. Through the changing of the day and night, and night and day, Allah is demonstrating his ability to organize a system that marks the start and end of a day. That is only one of the functions that the sun and the moon serve. And that too is only from our perspective. We're not even talking about the perspective of the sun and the moon to one another or the rest of the solar system. And without this system of day and night, we, the subjects of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we would know when to start our day, when to end our, our day. And on top of that, you know, this is, this is really Allah showing Allah's power over all of creations by telling us, you know, Allah created the sun and the moon, which are responsible for the presence of day and night. And this is true power because we are unable to recreate a sun or a moon or anything like it for that matter. It is, it is beyond our capability. So if collectively we band it together as a human race, even if we tried by pooling all of our resources, we would not be able to build a sun or a moon that will you know, just even serve our needs uh, or even the needs of the solar system in any capacity that it, it um, you know, helps the other planets. So the third piece that a ruler needs to demonstrate is action. And with the sun and the moon, Allah is subjecting every one of his creations to action, not just us people, but every creation is subject to the changing of the day and night. So as people, we sleep at night so that our bodies can recover from the work or the labor that we perform during the day. And if we look at other examples around us, you know, we can think about plants, for instance. Unless there's light present, most of the plants are going to produce carbon dioxide. So in the presence of light, and we know this from science and studying biology and plants and so on, is that the plants produce oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis. And if you didn't know, uh, photosynthesis is the process by which plants produce energy for their survival. So basically the, the food that they need to survive and continue to thrive and grow. Let's look at another example. So the rising of the tide, for example, you know, at night we, we have, as the moon travels around the earth, the gravity of the moon affects the oceans, causing tides to rise and fall. And depending on the distance of the moon from the earth, we could even see tides that are just larger than they normally would be. So that's the gravity of the moon affecting earth in that moment. So a true ruler has power to give and take, man action from his subjects and organize his subjects into a working system. Allah is the only thing that fits that definition. All of us are creations of Allah. Nothing that we do can happen without influence and permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah 
you know, tells us in this well-known verse that we have all probably heard many, many times over, which is from Surah Ad-Dariyat, I did not create jinn and humans except to worship me. Let's think about that verse for a minute. You know, Allah is telling us that jinn and humankind were created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we know that jinn and humankind have the ability to choose. So there is an element of choice there that's available to jinns as well as humans. So for us as humankinds to worship our creator, we must first learn about our creator. And why is that important? So to learn about our creator, we must acquire knowledge. Okay, so the acquisition of knowledge is a prerequisite in order to learn something. And knowledge must be present for it to be acquired. So there's a, there's a relationship there. You have to have knowledge and the knowledge must already exist. And there must be also present a teacher who's going to convey this knowledge to us. Okay. So since we cannot see Allah, we cannot expect that a teacher of this knowledge, um, or we can at least expect that a teacher of this knowledge will be from one of us because we can't directly see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, the knowledge about Allah being taught by another human being means that this person, whoever this might be, needs to be divinely inspired. And that has to be someone who is receiving this knowledge directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, it would be no different from a work of fiction. And this is another demonstration of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power. I mean, think about that. Allah is saying, you can't directly see me, but I will give you the knowledge in order to learn about me so that you can fulfill your purpose. And then on top of that, Allah divinely inspires his messengers and prophets who then go ahead and convey this knowledge to us. So he created knowledge, gave it to us in the form of the Quran and also before then the Bible as well as the Torah and passed on this knowledge down to humankind through his chosen prophets. And these prophets received this knowledge and were invited to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that capacity. So you know, we, we can choose, uh, you know, to obey. We can also choose to disobey. Some of us chose to disobey. And we've read about them in the Quran. We've learned about them over, you know, um, over Ramadan as we were reciting the Quran. But by obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and learning about our creator, we are asking for Allah's mercy. And we are fulfilling the purpose for which Allah has created us. Receiving knowledge and being grateful is how we can begin to learn, um, you know, how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, remember that our purpose in the Quran, as stated in the Quran, is uh, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the same purpose for jinn as well. So that leads into uh, an interesting question. What is the meaning of worship? What does it mean when Allah says, we are created for worship? Does that mean the only thing we ever do in our life every single day is salah? Absolutely not. You know, there's no one way of worship. There are many, many ways in which we can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one of the ways in which we do this is salat, as you all know. The other way is, you know, be a good Muslim. But what does, what does the definition of good mean? Whose definition of good are we using? Again, the definition is defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who tells us what is halal and what is haram. So some of those things of being good includes being a person who follows the laws that Allah has given to us, you know, forbidding that which is forbidden and engaging in that which is allowed and permitted. And being an obedient child is another example of being good. Being a helpful community member is another example of being good. Being a caring spouse, a caring neighbor, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, it's, it's basically living our life uh, in the way that Allah has described as halal for us. So in that state, when we are, when we are constantly abiding by that which is halal, we are in a constant state of worship. You know, observing the five pillars of Islam, for example, you know, giving our zakah, um, giving uh, or fasting and so on. Even the six pillars of Iman, as we know from the hadith of Jibreel, you know, that is another way in which we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we follow the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should find ourselves in a state of bliss. Why? Because we will immerse ourselves in implementing the acts that bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we will continue to maintain our drive to learn if we continue to keep ourselves close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, Sheikh Ibn uh, Atayla in his book, Kitab al-Hikam, the Book of Wisdom, tells us that 
deprivation hurts us only because of our lack of understanding of God. So what does that mean? You know, by this, the Sheikh is saying that our ignorance of God stops us from realizing divine mercy under adverse conditions. So if we're facing difficulty, you know, in our difficult situation, there's a lesson for us in it. You know, Allah might cause us to deviate so that we may recognize and appreciate that we couldn't see when we had uh, the mercy and blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right in front of us. You know, and that ignorance is our limiting factor is what uh, Ibn Atala is pointing out. So when we choose to return to Allah, when we choose to return to God, it's only then do we realize the mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, when they, when we say, you know, you don't know what you don't um, know when you don't have it. Uh, or rather, um, you know, you don't know what you have until you don't have it. And this is what Allah is, is giving us. There's a blessing in Allah's, uh, when Allah gives us adversity to learn from, there's also a blessing when Allah gives us ease and comfort to learn from. So inshallah, may Allah elevate our understanding of the Quran, help us to connect and reconnect with the Quran over and over again, because that is the source of knowledge for us. Even when we look at the ahadith, you know, the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Allah gave our Prophet um, guidance. Our Prophet Sallallahu is the living example of how to live our lives. And that sunnah was not just made up by our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is actually guidance from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So if we look at the Quran, for example, the Quran tells us, you know, you should pray five times a day. We know how to pray because of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because that was guidance received by our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about how to pray Salah, which verses do you recite in Salah? What are the physical movements of Salah? So all of that is part of the learning that we all have to you know, spend time in. It's very easy to get caught up in this world, but Alhamdulillah, Allah has given us a source of knowledge and examples of the implementation of this knowledge that we can you know, then follow. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, you know, please remember that our ability to choose is the same as our ability to decide. When we decide on something, we are definitely excluding every other possible decision that we could have made and the corresponding outcomes of those decisions. And this is how we as people move about in this world. You know, this is how progress is made in this world. You make a decision and you act on that decision and then you change course as you need to. But that is essentially how we make progress, how we move about our day and, and our lives in this world. So we make decisions, we make choices and the choices we make impacts our ability um, you know, to make or not make any progress. And our ability to make choices is not arbitrary. We just don't say, I'm going to make this choice. Every choice we make in this lifetime, in our day, in the moment we wake up and we're, we're aware, it is based on some information, on some knowledge. It is based on information we have in our hands, basically. And this means that in the absence of good information, we will make bad choices. And therein lies an interesting point for us to ponder about, you know, whose definition of bad are we using? And I'm not talking about you know, bad decisions in a trivial sense. I'm talking about bad decisions that have a lasting impact, you know, on our spiritual health. That is one dimension that we may not pay a whole lot of attention to on a daily basis. How do we build that spiritual health of ours? You know, there's physical health we can build through exercise and through activity. But what about that spiritual health? If we learn something about our skills and our craft and we apply it on a daily basis, we get better in that craft every day. The same is also true about building our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our spiritual health is dependent on our ability to build that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the decisions we make will drive how that health gets better day in and day out. You know, just remember, and I remind myself first that we are celestial as well as terrestrial beings. Our soul is celestial, connects to us, connects us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and our body is terrestrial that is grounded in this world. So how we choose our actions in this life will have a material impact on our life in the hereafter. So I remind myself again, first and foremost, um, you know, and then all of you that we owe it to ourselves. We owe it to ourselves. Uh, to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not just because 
It is the right thing to do, but it is also because Allah has said that that is our purpose in life, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the way we worship is we learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our welfare in the hereafter uh, is dependent on our ability to spend the time, make that decision to invest in our spiritual health and invest in our learning as well, uh, you know, how we live our lives. So let's pray, inshallah, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we receive Allah's guidance and may Allah accept all of our du'as, all of our struggles in their entirety. And may Allah guide our hearts towards him, inshallah. إن المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات وقانتين وقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات وذاكرين الله كثيرا وذاكرات عد الله لهم مغفرة وعجر عظيما ربنا حبنا من أزواجنا وزرياتنا كرة عين وجلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار رب جلني مكيم الصلاة ومن زريات ربنا وتقبل دعاء ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحبل وحبلنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا عليك توكلنا وعليك أنبنا وعليك المصير ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنة للذين كفروا واغفر لنا ربنا إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنا كنا لا من الخاسرين ربنا آمنا فاغفر لنا وارحمنا وأنت خير الراحمين إن الله يأمر بالأدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لعلكم تذكرون لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين